I recently listened to Crucial Conversations on audio, and honestly, I did not expect that much out of it. I thought it would be this short, behavior-based communication skill book, and instead, I found it full of depth on how to improve difficult conversations. In this summary, I'm going to share the essence of how Crucial Conversations teaches you to have good dialogue by making it safe to talk about anything. And I'm going to share the five most important things I learned from Crucial Conversations. Now, like I said, I didn't expect much out of this book. I thought it would be another skills-based approach that teaches the right words to say to basically manipulate others into doing what you want. But in the long run, that approach I don't believe is very effective. So I, I went into this book not really expecting much of it, and instead I found a depth of theory that from my therapy perspective was halfway between Sue Johnson's emotion-focused therapy and John Gottman's approach, which include things like Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work and The Four Horsemen and etc. So from my totally therapy-centered approach, I saw this book as all about creating safety so that problems could be solved. Because this book goes deeper than behavior, I think it offers real solutions to improving relationships and managing intensely emotional conversations. So let's jump in to some of the essential skills. So the first one is remember your goal. So this first skill is to continually remind yourself of your goal, which is to share a conversation and to solve a problem and not allow yourself to get sidetracked by switching goals. So a lot of times we get caught up in contention, like needing to be right, needing to win, needing to punish others, needing to be justified. So instead, this book encourages you to keep in mind the question, what do I want for myself and for others and for the relationship? So for example, when having a discussion with a teenager about curfew, instead of getting locked up in what time they have to be home, Continually remind yourself and them that what you really want is for them to be safe and for you to be able to trust them to be responsible. They also want to be trusted and seen as responsible because that comes with freedoms. So that shared goal of mutual trust can get you on the same team as you work to figure out what time they should be home. Number two, watch for signs of stress. So learn to look for signs of crucial conversations and signs of stress within yourself. When you notice yourself getting heated, take a deep breath. Actively calm yourself and remind yourself to stick to the goal, which is shared dialogue and shared meaning. This step is basically learning to be responsive instead of reactive to the situation. Number three, give yourself more options. So let go of false dichotomies. In therapy, we call this black and white thinking. So for example, I either had to let the boss walk all over me or I had to rudely embarrass him. I had to say nothing or I would lose my job. So instead of these dichotomies, instead of you know this black and white thinking, you ask yourself to step back and really consider, are there truly no other options? Is there anyone in the company who uses a different strategy or approach for dealing with that situation? And your goal is to relax a little bit and invite creativity and flexibility. My dad once told me the story of a college president who, during the Vietnam War, he was struggling to know how to deal with the protesters on his campus. He had one group who wanted to burn the American flag to show their anger about the draft and the war. And he had the football team who was surrounding the flag to protect it. As tensions were rising, violence seemed imminent. And in similar situations, other universities sent in riot police or the National Guard, and this led to escalating tension and injuries and deaths. But this university president stepped back, took a look at the situation, and made an offer. What if we wash the flag? A symbolic move that both shows respect and the need for improvement. And because of his willingness to look for that third option, the situation was resolved peacefully. Number four, check how you see others. This was my number one takeaway. Whenever someone reverts to silence, like shutting down, withdrawing, going quiet, or violence, like aggression, raising their voice, or arguing, our natural reaction is to respond more forcefully, 
arguing our point or getting frustrated that they won't participate. And instead, this book challenges us to see silence or violence as a sign that the other person isn't feeling safe to talk. They feel like their point isn't being considered and they get into a fight or flight mode. When we see this, we have to stop ourselves and ask, what can I do to restore safety? Crucial conversations suggest some practical steps to restoring safety. So they need to know that you care about them and their interests. So show them respect. Check yourself. Am I listening? Am I validating? Am I acting defensive or being condescending or sarcastic? Am I showing them that I value hearing what they are saying, even if I don't agree? Now, I think this step is really powerful because we can actively create a safe environment by how we treat the other person. When people feel that you care about them and value them, it invites them to relax and be able to absorb what you're saying and share what they need to. So it makes it more likely that you'll have a successful conversation that actually solves problems. Number five, creating safety. A big part to restoring safety is working on yourself. But there are some other skills that are pretty straightforward to help others feel safe, understood, and valued. So one of these is front-loading. This is starting off conversations gently. When a topic is crucial, we tend to get nervous and go into it like tightly after avoiding it for a while. So instead, lead in gently. For example, there's something I'd like to get your opinion on, but I'm worried that you'll be upset if I bring it up. Front-loading can help a conversation go better right from the start. Here's another one. Point out what you agree on. Highlight the areas you share instead of only focusing on the parts you disagree with. Keep pointing out your common goal. For example, I really want to be able to work well with you. This relationship is more important. Or let's see how we can solve this in a way that everyone can accept. If you need to, make a tentative guess about what they're feeling upset about, but not in a judgmental way. So for example, you could say, it sounds like you're feeling like your opinion isn't being heard. Number six, master your stories. So this sixth chapter on mastering your stories, it's like this combination of the book Leadership and Self-Deception and narrative therapy and a little bit of CBT thrown in for good measure. But basically it tries to help you see when you're interpreting situations in a way that harms the process. Stories are our assumptions of why people are doing what they're doing. For example, seeing yourself as the victim or blaming others as being lazy or selfish are types of stories that we tell ourselves. Distorting the facts by exaggerating their wrongs or highlighting their strengths is why these stories become problematic. Now, I thought this chapter was on point, but to me, it feels like a couple of books worth of information in one short chapter. So I wonder if people are actually able to absorb it in small doses or if it is better addressed in more depth. Regardless, you should check yourself for signs of this. Do you have repeating patterns at work like, why is everyone out to get me? Or all bosses are authoritarian a-holes. Or I'm the only hard worker around here. When you see your underlying stories for what they are, stories, then you can see past them and solve real problems. Try to replace defensiveness with curiosity. This is something that I struggle with, and this book frames this in an interesting way. When faced with someone who seems to be getting angry, shutting down, or being irrational, rather than ask, what's the worst, most personal way I can take this, which leads to defensiveness, we should ask, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person think or feel this way? Leading to curiosity. It's hard to feel defensive and curious at the same time. Assuming that they're doing the best they can can help us understand their obstacles to having good dialogue around crucial issues. When it comes down to it, what I appreciated most about this book was its emphasis on creating real safety by giving me the responsibility to create that safe environment. And it teaches the tools to make that happen. Thanks for watching, and if you found this content helpful, please consider sharing it with someone who also might find it helpful. Take care.